All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, we're using the microphone for the camera, but the uh, room speaker isn't working, so we're going to skip that part. Um, you know where you're at, San Francisco PHP Meetup. Um, it's hosted here by Mashery. Um, they're also sponsoring the food and the beverages, my time, Jacob's time. Uh, we have O'Reilly sponsoring off a couple of books that we're going to raffle off. We also have uh, 15 $25 gift cards to AWS and a $1,000 promo code for Google App Engine. Um, so some good raffle stuff for this afternoon, uh, or this evening. Uh, tonight we're going to be doing lightning talks. Uh, we had seven people sign up, uh, one person bailed, so there's going to be six. Uh, if you have one that you're going to be throwing together in the next 15, 20 minutes as uh, the other ones are going, um, you're welcome to stand up and go. Don't need slides, just talk. It's fine. Um, very open. It's the first time doing this, uh, so we'll see how well it works out for us. Um, we're going to do five-minute timer. Each person gets five minutes, hard cut at, cut at the end. And then uh, we'll move on to the next person, um, you know, a minute or so in between. Um, my, we got next month's talk lined up. Um, Igor is going to be doing a talk about static code analysis for PHP. Um, so he's got a project that he's uh, done a lot of work on with that. He's going to talk on a few other ones uh, that are out there as well. Um, that'll be on January 9th, a Thursday. Um, we're still working out exactly where we're going to host that one. Um, haven't uh, tracked that down yet. Um, I think that's everything. Uh, so usually we do a realm for announcements for anybody. Uh, anybody looking to be hired? Wow, all right. That's great. Uh, anyone looking to hire someone? Even better, no recruiters. Woo! Um, that's, yes. <laughs> Looking for mentors, so that's a good one. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name off the top of my head. Stan, so hit up Stan afterwards. Um, mailing list is good. The IRC chat rooms are always good for that kind of stuff as well. Uh, uh, PHPMentoring.com, so shout out to them. Um, and with that, we'll, uh, we'll kick off with the first talk. Um, and so I, so I don't have to get back up again. We'll just go ahead and do mine first. Um, Jacob, can you grab a timer thing for me? Keep an eye on it, because I would hate to be the one that screws up the whole timing thing. That just wouldn't be right, would it? Ah! All right, let's go. So uh, I'm Mike. Um, going to do just a quick talk about Composer. Uh, how many people are using Composer? About half. Not bad. Um, are the people that are not, are you using some other dependency manager for PHP? Okay, so you should definitely check out Composer then. It's a great dependency manager tool for PHP. Um, you define your project dependencies, or the dependencies inside the project. Um, is everyone familiar with Pair? Remember Pair? The few people use it these days. Um, it's basically what, what Pair should have turned into, um, but they didn't get there fast enough. Uh, so Composer and Packages came along and uh, are it instead. Uh, it's heavily influenced by uh, Ruby's bundler and Node.js's uh, NPM. Um, so it's basically define some form of dependency. So in this case here, we're saying we're requiring that it's version of PHP that's greater than or equal to 5.3. Uh, we're saying we want a guzzle package that's 3.7. anything. We want any version of Zen Framework 2 that is for these packages. And in our dev environment, we want Symfony class loader, PHP unit, and the PHCS fixer. Um, PHCS fixer, by the way, is a great app too. You should look into that one if you're not already. Um, you drop this into your project, and if you've installed Composer, you basically run Composer install dash dash dev, and that goes through and installs those dependencies into a vendor directory. It also creates an auto loader for each of those. So each package that's installed tells it as part of its definition, says how to do auto-loading for this package. Um, so all you got to do in your code is you require the auto-loader, and then you can just use those packages, just as if you had done, written your own auto-loader or downloaded and, you know, got rid of the, you know, uncompress a TGZ or something like that. Um, it just handles and sticks it all on there for you. Um, it's really nice because you can define the different versions. Um, you can lock to very specific. You can lock to a hash. You can lock to stable or to dev or to alpha. Um, lots of cool stuff you can do with it. Um, by default, the packages use packages.org. Um, think of it 
um, you know, like uh, when you go to look for Ruby Gems or you know the M I can't remember npm site. Is it just npm.org? Yeah, anyway, um, you can search for packages up there. Um, you can define your own source repos if you want. Um, so you can have an internal version control system, or you can even tell it to, I want to download a zip file and uncompress it, and that's how I install this dependency. Um, also, unlike pair, uh, anyone can create a project on Packagist. Uh, you just got to set up a proper composer.json, um, have all that stuff um, that defines you know, where where's the source code come from, uh, this, that, and the other thing. Um, most people you know, link it on there, and just the source code comes from GitHub, um, but it can come from any other uh, public thing. It supports CVS, SVN, Git, um, Git you name it, it's Mercurial. Um, many projects that are on there, the larger ones especially, they have sub packages. So we saw with Zen Framework, I don't want all of Zen Framework, I just want these three specific parts. Um, so many projects are split up that way, so that's really nice if you don't want the entire massive project uh, in your code. Um, and that's basically it. Um, any quick questions about it? We got time for like one question. No? All right. What's that? Yes, you can set up your own code repositories. You can set up, uh, you know, to an internal server, external server, um, external file system. You know, a file mount, um, whatever you want, S3 buckets, whatever you want it to be, you can define it, and it will. Um, I mean, almost everything, um, but not quite. I'm sorry? Yes. Multiple repositories? Yes, and you can have your own version of packages and all that kind of fun stuff. I'm sorry? Uh, I don't know. Oh. Yeah, it'll define it. The PHP thing's nice, you know, it, it just locks the version to run the app. Um, and it will give you a fatal error if it's not the right version of PHP for some reason. Um, here's a couple of the links. Link to Composer, link to Packagist. Um, the slides uh, will be posted on the website as well. There's a quick link for it. There's me, and um, you know, there we go. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, who's next? Let me stand up. All right, we're gonna do Vagrant. Hey guys, we got a um, talk on PHP development using Vagrant. My name is Asman. Oh. I'm Eric. Um, so the problem that I think a lot of us have come across is setting up multiple development environments. Um, you know, if you're an established developer, you may have you know, multiple environments with different versions of PHP, maybe different versions of Apache. Or if you're new to PHP development, you just want to start writing some code. Um, a lot of times, people have to, you know, learn how to operate a server before they can actually start writing PHP code and testing it. Um, so, uh, <coughs> yeah. So our solution was to just uh, uh, use one configure one um, 
environment uh, and just s script the, uh, build the whole environment uh, with a vagrant script and just uh, uh, code to that uh, in our virtual environment and then uh, you know, have that match up to our production environment. <coughs> So the, the tools that we use um, are Vagrant, which actually provides the scripting environment, VirtualBox, which lets you organize and create the virtual machines, Chef provides you the scripting language, and Git for project hosting. Um, so we thought this was pretty cool. Um, so we, we got our scripts working for us and uh, threw them up online um, for other people to check out and share. Um, they built up the whole uh, LAMP stack. Um, we thought maybe we could branch out from that to other environments, um, but they're available to check out and share and add to on uh, stackalicious.com. And uh, we're going to have a workshop in a little while, and you can email us for details. That's, that's it. Anybody have any questions? We have some time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I use PHP Storm. Or we, we both do. Yeah. Um, have you been able to play around with the uh, We haven't done that yet, but I think PHP Storm should be able to hook into that. Um, yeah, I saw that in the in the release notes. So Vagrant, I think, allows you to use a few different options between, like, Chef or Puppet. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or shell scripts. You can always just hook in and do a basic bash script. No, no PHP option. <laughs> yeah, so we've got our scripts online. It's open source. You can take a look at how it works, play with it. Um, and like you said, we're going to have a workshop next month. We're trying to add as many languages and environments we can and open source all of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We Yeah, we've seen that online. I've seen they at least have a LAMP stack package, um, which is pretty similar to what we have. Um, and hmm? um, yeah. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, who's up next? Chris on. Okay. Yeah, they uh, should already be loaded. Thank you. Who's timing? Okay, I'm Chris Jones. I work at Oracle down here in Redwood Shores, down there in Redwood Shores. Um, I work in a Linux kind of kernel engineering space, and I contribute a little bit to PHP and some other scripting languages, um, mostly to the Oracle database driver for PHP. But I hang around the internals a little bit. Uh, Hannah's does a little bit as well. So kind of know what's going on. You can hit us up for uh, questions about uh, PHP development if you want. I'm here to talk about Dtrace. Um, some of you may have seen on the YouTube a couple of years back, there was an Australian in a very noisy computer room yelling at a disk drive, and he'd run back to his console, and he could see on the graphs that just yelling at the disk drives um, decreased the throughput on the disk drives itself. And so the, the, the tool that he was using to do this was actually Dtrace, although he had some fancy graphing scripts on it. So you get this always available, low overhead tracing framework. So it's always on. You can use it in production. You can use it in development. 
it's on those platforms, as you can see, listed there. It's a sort of Solaris-based platforms, and then d uh, came out into some of the other Unixes, the OSXs, most recently the Oracle Linux, which I've been working on. Um, so it's been around for a while. It's uh, extremely useful for troubleshooting right through the application stack. So you just need the one tool, right from user applications, right down through to the uh, OS. So the crux of it really is these sort of D scripts, a little bit orcish, you can see there. Um, it's, this is a sort of shell script. Um, it's, uh, this particular one, you can see there's a pattern slash arg zero greater than equal to five. You kind of need to know what's happening here. Um, there's an e malloc c function call inside PHP code, and this is tracing that whenever that e malloc c function call is hit, and the first argument, the arg zero to that, is greater than five, which is basically the, the number of bytes you want to have allocated, then we're gonna do this printf call. So this is, this is a tracing script. It's different from some of the other D languages out there. It's the dynamic tracing D language. So you can run the script here. This is a command line. You can use this in a web environment as well. And uh, you know whatever your, your PHP script does, whenever it hits a malloc call, uh, you'll see this output. There are also, in this language, which I'm not going to go into detail here, there are lots of things like aggregation, so the really complex functionality that you can put into, th into this. Sampling, if you want to do sort of dynamic sampling, so there's a tick rate, you can fire things off every you know, one second, five seconds, things like that. This is about as complex as I'm going to show you today. So what happens with PHP is, uh, so that was a, a C function call right in, in the C um, um, code for PHP, which you kind of had to know about. But PHP itself has user space statically defined traces. And these are kind of akin to printfs, which are in the code. And the key thing here is that they're no ops unless something's actually interested in tracing them. Unless there's that, that Descript, like the one I showed you in the previous slide, actually registers interest in a particular probe and says, hey, I want, want to see the output from this probe. They're just no ops in, your, in the code, in the C-based code. So the overhead is really low. And as you saw with that grep pattern matching in the, the previous slide, that they're looking for the arg zero greater than zero, we're not even logging things unless that pattern is matched. So we're, you know, low overhead implementation and low overhead, um, two, what's two minutes or two, two minutes, okay. So it was a, a Peckle extension some, some while back. Um, I recently did some, some fixes into PHP itself, pushed some configuration changes so the build works a little cleaner most recently. So you pick up one of these latest versions. A couple of RPMs I've got around as well if you've got a, an Oracle Linux installed. So these are the static probes which you can get. Um, nowadays, the sort of useful ones there are the sort of function entry, function return. So that's the PHP level function entry, function return. And you can actually print out and do timing between these to work out how long each function is taking. Um, obviously, you get requests start up and shut down as well. So this is uh, an example. There are lots of example libraries out there. There's uh, Brendan Griggs got a dtrace toolkit, has uh, example D scripts, uh, the programming scripts from PHP, Python, system scripts. Um, and I have a blog post about this, about tracing Silex. So after we had the Silex talk last month, I went to trace this. And on the right, you can't really see here, but I could do the indentation for the, the system calls. Uh, you can see system calls, and then we're going into the PHP calls, the files which are being called in that Silex framework, request.php, which line it was. And you can do all sorts of timing there in the microseconds. So for comparison, dtrace is designed for very low overhead, runtime and logging, big community. Interesting thing is it compiles those scripts into a safe intermediate form so it can't crash your system. Some other things like system tap, which are available only on Linux, you get compiled into a kernel module which can do whatever it likes with a kernel and crash your system. XHProf you might have heard of, very popular, also very useful, a lot of tooling around just but purely for PHP so you can't trace through the system stack. Finn, that's it. You can find me at those addresses. <laughs> Who's next? Uh, pretty simple. Um, we can we can look at that. Okay. Thank you. All right, so my name is Anas, or Piore, I say Twitter, email, whatever. Um, I've been doing a lot of work on the PHP project for the past roughly 10 years. I'm quickly gonna do a PHP.net uh, uh, time lapse. 
as most of you probably know, we launched a new website a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in 1997, it's found, found in our history, uh, December 1997, we had a different domain, php.iquest.com, and by then, uh, at that point, the people were called phpfi, form interpreter. This was the website. It's pretty cute. You can look it up on the web archive. I, I didn't find any previous version of it, but PHP had been alive for two years at this point. Uh, as you can see, they even had example scripts like typical guest book, which no longer is that popular today, but it has been quite popular. So these sort of basic tool links that you could actually download from a website. So at the same time, in 1997, December, PHP uh, got its own domain, php.net. They were trying to rebrand themselves and actually were called professional homepages for some period of time. I've never seen that before until I read through the uh, history today. So that was some sort of transition domain, uh, transition name while they were transferring over to PHP uh, 3, which was in the works. You had to register to get a copy of PHP 3. There was a private uh, download page, but if you knew the URL, download.php3, then you could download PHP. <laughs> the security at the time was pretty amazing, right? Um, so this is the next update, a little later in December. It's pretty much the same website, right? But at this point, they changed the, uh, changed the front page a little bit. Uh, apparently, there was a network of sites, I don't know. And it's completely free. It was amazing at this point. A uh, week later, 97. Awesome logo, dude. <laughs> this is a huge change. Remember, this is still the first iteration of the PHP website, right? Now it became public beta, but you still had to register to be able to download it. But it's completely free, guys. Just provide us with your email address. Um, and then the next update, a few days later, there was a note. February issue of Web Techniques has full article on PHP 3. We don't really give a shit today, but <laughs> uh, come on, 13 years ago, this was a huge news. 15 years ago, this was a breaking news, right? Someone read an article on PHP. We even had four mirrors, two in Israel, one in Norway, and one in Canada. I don't care which mirror hosted it was in Canada, but the guys in Israel and Norway, they got the credits. I don't know why. Um, we had a list of high-profile websites running PHP. Apparently, the NHL, NFL guys, Dan Brockers and Oakland Raiders were quite early on catching on PHP here, uh, quite cool. Um, there's a huge, uh, huge list, there's like 50 domains that were running PHP at this point, I guess. Um, even had a list of articles talking about PHP, how cool is that? Uh, and as you can see, the awesome logo running there. If you notice in the, in the under the logo, it says running PHP 553, yes, that website was actually running on my laptop today, unmodified on PHP 5.3, and this is written PHP 3, right? Uh, 98, fast forward, uh, new website, awesome, I love it. This is not a, this not frames, and this is not front page uh, rollovers, this is actually just awesome website. Uh, <laughs> fast forward, some, some updates, we changed the name from whatever to whatever, I don't even remember what it was. Um, we updated the mass, uh, Polar Lander was running PHP, I don't know if that's true, but they said that. Um, so it's still like two, uh, 99, we had two versions. They had a full entry of all user cro contributing notes to the manual. That was called the manual errata. Uh -huh. um, 2001, three years later, March 8th. Oh my God, does anyone recognize that? <laughs> same day, we got the left toolbar. And then the same day, a few hours later, same day still, and we got the classical design. Woo! Now let's fast forward. Well, still nothing changed. 2010, nothing changed. 2008, well, we did try to get a redesign. This was the redesign at the point. No one really gave a shit, so we kind of gave it up. 2010, we tried again. That was the result, and three years later, well, it still looked pretty much the same. Manual mega drop down. December, three years later, or 15 years later, victory! So if anyone want to help, get some more progress into the project, join us uh, on the mailing list, send a focus on php phpnet or check out the GitHub re repo. It should be fairly trivial to set up these days, although I don't make any promises. Question? A question, sorry. Unfair question, but thank you for <laughs> Since no one said yes, then I appreciate the question. All right.
So, uh, Keith or, uh, Joe? Keith. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> San Antonio's. All right. So um, I'm basically going to talk about developing and deploying from an iPad or an Android tablet. Uh, first of all, who, who here has actually tried to develop from a tablet? I see three, four, five, a handful. Uh, who who actually has done it more than once? <laughs> okay, I'm not the only stubborn idiot. <laughs> All right, so um, there's there's a lot more to do than just upload your files to the server. Uh, there's version control. So obviously, just using um, SFTP. You can SFTP to your server. You can SSH in to do all your, your stuff with your version control. Um, that's fine. That works. Uh, it's not very efficient, especially if you have an iPad. You're coding for a while. Your, S your SSH client gets killed. You have to go log back in. Well, I, iPad or Android tablet. I'm, I'm more, an more iPad focused because that's what I've got here. Um, there's no full IDEs for iPad because Apple won't allow them. I'm sure there's one or two out there for Android, so it's more more Apple leaning. I'm sorry. It, it's not. Um, last I checked, it doesn't actually have Git support, so it's kind of a deal breaker. Um, so SFTP and then SSH in to do your version control stuff. Not really efficient. Um, you can automate that a lot. Um, Basically, bash scripts and um, what I ended up doing, bash scripts and um, just scheduling a job to run the script periodically. Um, script loops looks for specific files. Uh, I've got a file you put the name of the branch you want to check out. Um, file you can put a commit message in that'll do a commit and a push. Um, over on the other end of things, you have the server or wherever you're doing your development, um, wherever your code actually lives can go ahead and, and pull that periodically, and you get basically a somewhat automated um, version control environment. Obviously, um, if you're pushing every single thing or committing every single thing into your repo um, before you merge that into your any of your main branches, you're going to squash that down. Um, but that does give you, you know, a step-by-step -step history of every revision you've made. Um, everything's automated because so you just upload a file and the automation script kind of does everything. Um, I didn't have a chance to prepare slides. I uh, will actually post a URL to the automation that I've done um, on the SFPHP group. Um, and if anyone has any questions about you know, specific reasons, I had actually a specific project-based need for automating at this level. Uh, if anyone has any questions about any specific reasons why you would do this over just manually doing things, um, go ahead and, uh, and ask. Um, there's not a project specific reason to necessarily be writing code on the iPad or on really any tablet. It's more of a didn't have the chance to bring the whole laptop with me kind of deal, but um, yeah, I'm the, pr the I don't want to get into details of the project because it's in Node, it's not PHP, so, um, but I'll be more than happy to, to talk with you about that after um, everyone else has had their talks. Any other questions or? Well, I'm I'm set. So
Right. Um, I can, I mean, you can do anything really. It, it depends on like how much work you want to put into it. Um, I'll get, I'll talk to you a little bit later though. All right, uh, Joe right there. Cool. Hi everyone, my name is Joe Marama. I work uh, at Fox. I'm filling in for my um, teammate, Anthony Bishoprick, who is out sick today. Um, so I just got these slides like an hour ago, so excuse the lack of polish. Um, so basically what me and my teammate Anthony do is write PHP extensions that will help our company. Um, and our latest extension, Augmented Types, is sort of the focus of this talk. So um, we have a not really a problem, just a desire to have some statically statically analyzable code in our code base. So we, we have a monolithic PHP web app with um, about half a million lines of code and growing. And, and um, the fact that PHP is dynamically typed sort of bites us occasionally. So it's hard to know what you're pulling out of params arrays and all this other stuff that we find everywhere in our code. Um, so enter our newest extension, augmented types. Well, yes, we're suckers for management by virtue of using PHP. Um, so, augmented types basically is a C extension that wraps all function calls, instance method calls and um, normal function calls. And it basically enforces types uh, that are embedded into PHP doc. And so this is uh, sort of what we wanted because we wanted a way to strongly enforce um, return types and argument types and enforce primitive types and all these other things that we can do. And But we don't want to modify the abstract syntax tree of PHP. So we built this. Um, it sort of operates in a way similar to xdebug, where it wraps the way PHP is compiled and executed. And um, turns out you can do a lot when you control that. So we basically wrote a little mini language, or a, like a mini type system for PHP. Um, so it enforces PHP doc at runtime, right? If you, if you say this function is going to return an int, um, and it doesn't return an int, it's going to barf in fatal error ID. So now in a little error string that you see down there. Um, and we also enforce that every function must have valid PHP doc um, in parts of our code base. More on that later. Um, so yeah, uh, it will barf at you if you don't do that. Um, and yeah, in the future, we hope to apply a lot more static analysis using this. So if you say, oh yeah, we also have disjunctive types. Um, so this function can return either a foo object or a null, um, and that's enforced. Um, but yeah, if we hook into static analysis later, we can say, oh, you might be calling the function do it on uh, null, which leads to a fatal error and is bad, and yeah. And so um, I think that's the end of the slides. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, the type system is awesome because we can do whatever we want. So we added in a bunch of like different types, like array of type. You can say like int bracket bracket, and that will enforce that the array you take um, is all integers and stuff like that. And we have variadic types, so for functions that take variable numbers of arguments. And yeah, and that's a, uh, yeah, it just gives us more safety in our code base. Yada, yada, yada. Go. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we support mix. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, so we sor we can sort of do that by, um, we have an any directive that you can set to specify the, the error level that will barf out you. Um, but yeah, we, we always want to err on the side of being more strict because we want more safety in our code. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Um, I mean, in this example, there is, or in the previous example, there is none, but, oh. In the previous example, there is none, but we want to be able to statically catch that. That's, yeah. Is that the, come on. Oh, cool. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that is a that is a great question. Um, it's not too bad, but it totally depends on how much you're how much work you're doing per function, right? So if you if you're calling a function that tries to enforce an array of ints, it's going to have to iterate through that whole array when checking that. And if that function doesn't do much work and you call it a lot, there will be a, will be a performance head overhead, but it's generally not that much. Um, I've seen in various micro benchmarks like maximum 20%, but it's totally variable. Yes, we're going to open source it by the end of the year, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah.